Well, good morning, Greenwich, and welcome to the Wednesday, March 17th, St. Patrick's Day edition of the Basement Academy. Uh, I hope this day finds you in good health and uh, appreciating what this day is, I think, really supposed to be about, and it's remembering Patrick, one who deeply loved Jesus and spread the faith significantly uh, in Ireland. It's not about leprechauns and magic and all that other stuff uh, that we've made it into. So, happy St. Pat's. Um, our morning psalm, Psalm 47. I like this one. It's going to tie in a little bit to our question and wrestling for the day. This is for the director of music of the Sons of Korah. Clap your hands, all you nations. Shout to God with cries of joy. How awesome is the Lord Most High, the great King over all the earth. He subdued nations under us, peoples under our feet. He chose our inheritance for us, the pride of Jacob, whom he loved. Selah. God has ascended amid shouts of joy, the Lord amid the sounding of trumpets. Sing praises to God, sing praises, sing praises to our King, sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth. Sing to Him a psalm of praise. God reigns over the nations, God is seated on His holy throne. The nobles of the nations assemble as the people of the God of Abraham. For the kings of the earth belong to God. He is greatly exalted. Psalm 47. It's a psalm of praise and calling Israel, and I think by extension, all peoples to uh, the praise of, of God. And so it is this joyful recognition that God has ascended. God is in the presence of his people. It's this last line the nobles of the nations assemble as the people of the God of Abraham. This, this vision of a time when all peoples, all nations are gathered under the lordship and authority of God and his Christ, Jesus. And so with that in mind, I want to dive into another question. Okay, so Hopefully the questions uh, that I've been putting have given you something to think about, our capacity for hard truths, um, and then how you are preparing for the new moral order that is upon us. And so today's question kind of extends a little bit beyond that. How do you, how do I, how do we, how do you engage the work of racial justice and unity, equality, all of those things that we're hearing about, how do we engage the work of racial justice and unity without yielding the high ground to the critical race theorists, okay? Talked a little bit about critical race theory, the cultural tsunami uh, that we talked about last fall, kind of this this thing that's sweeping uh, our nation, some of which I spoke about yesterday, okay, some of the, the new moral order. So how do we engage the work of racial unity? Christians ought to be engaged in that work. We ought to care about this. The scriptures um, are clear <laughs> that we are all image bearers. All humans are, are image bearers. So how do we engage the work without yielding to the critical race theory, this alternative framework that is gaining ascendancy, um, has gained ascendancy really in our society. It is part of that new order. And so uh, I've been thinking about this for a while. I'm going to try to offer some thoughts here uh, and appreciate the opportunity to think out loud. Um, so kind of backstory. Um, several weeks ago, I mentioned that I've been watching the PBS, Public Broadcasting System special, The Black Church. It's a two-part uh, special. Um, really, it's four parts, but it comes in two two-hour packages. <laughs> um, 
I would encourage you to watch that if you haven't already. I know some have because I've, I've heard from you. Um, but I would encourage you to watch that. It, it was, for me, it was both inspiring and, and saddening, okay? Inspiring in the sense of seeing what our sisters and brothers in Christ have endured, how they have persevered, the tenacity of their faith, their commitment to one another, their commitment to the gospel, their commitment to scripture, their commitment to Jesus and singing and worship. And, and their, their commitment to uh, hospitality, to welcoming, as they've been outcasts in our society so often, people of color, um, African Americans, the, the, the hospitality that they have towards others. Um, so it's very inspiring, but, but very discouraging and saddening to realize that much of the suffering of the black church in America was and probably still is at the hands of the white church. Instead of having their back, instead of caring for sisters and brothers in Christ, instead of advocating for them and seeking their safety and security, many in the white church in America, kind of the dominant church, were seeking to put them out and put them aside and put them down. And, and so you have to watch it to, to engage um, the, that yourself. So I'd, I'd be curious to, to hear from some of you. So, so that would be one thing I would encourage you to do as part of the engagement um, to, 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 to wrestle with that. Uh, second, I've been reading um, a recent issue of Christianity Today, the, the March uh, edition, and it has three articles about multiracial or multi-ethnic, kind of same idea, multiracial churches in the United States and some of the experience of pastors, the experience of congregants, and, and some kind of biblical theological analysis that, that wraps around it. And, and so I just want to read one, one little section in one of the articles. Um, talking about all pastors, you know, have to navigate conflict. So that's just a reality. I, you know, and Eric at Greenwich have, you know, always on the lookout for conflict, but particularly the challenges that, here's the quote, the challenges that multiracial church pastors face are heightened because people who are ethnically similar share similar ideas of how church should look the length of worship services, the music sung, the preaching style, the appropriate clothing, the languages spoken, the food served as just some examples. Without this commonality, more conflict arises and those with more power set church culture and structure. Okay, let me try to translate that a little bit. The challenge that multiracial church pastors face. In a, every, every pastor deals with conflict, okay? But it's heightened for multiracial because the different ethnic groups making up that multiracial or multi-ethnic fellowship, that church, each of those groups has their own cultural tastes and preferences and understandings and kind of taken for grantedness. How long should the service be? How long should the sermon be? What kind of music should be sung? What kind of instrument should accompany that music? We talked about this, was it last week or two weeks ago, when talking about, somebody asked about worship, uh, traditional hymns versus contemporary worship, and I talked about all worship is enculturated. It's enculturated in forms and in styles that are common to the parishioners, the congregants, those who gather. So when you take a multi-ethnic, a multi-racial church with all of these expectations of how long Sunday service should be, is it only on Sunday? And all the dynamics of what those individuals uh, believe because of their own ethnic and, and, and racial background, it just creates greater context. So the article was very poignant about that. Um, one of the other articles talked about um, second and third generation immigrants, who those who've uh, immigrated to the U.S. 
and then have tried to um, kind of uh, assimilate into uh, American churches and mostly white churches, and over time finding that they just aren't quite understood because of certain customs and ethnic expectations that they have. And so many of these folks have gone back to their single race, single ethnic church of their origin, of their childhood, perhaps. And so, it, again, interesting, just the difficulty of finding local churches that are multi-ethnic, multi-racial, and are sustained over time. A lot of them just struggle. Okay, so it was very, very interesting. I, I was unaware of that. I do hear a, a, a fair amount of time in our presbytery and in our Presbyterian context that our Presbyterian church, which is like 97% white, should be more diverse, more racially, ethnically diverse. And this call to have our local churches be more racially and ethnically diverse. And, and I've asked the question in some of these Presbytery contexts and a couple of these seminars I visited, tell me how. Don't tell me that it should be. I, I'll, I'll sign on to that it should be different. Tell me how. Because I think in order to be different, we would have to start singing different songs, maybe with different instruments. We might have to have a longer service. We might have to meet at a different time. Uh, we might, there, there might be lots of changes and maybe we should do that. I'm not saying we shouldn't, but I've yet to hear anybody tell me how to do it. And so I get a little frustrated with the kind of the call out that, you know, our churches aren't more ethnically, racially diverse, but then nobody's showing the way how to do it. And so I've been thinking about this for, for quite some time. So how do we engage the work of racial justice and unity without yielding the moral high ground to critical race theory? So let me let me unpack some things just as just to think out loud with you and and then this this hopefully won't won't be uh, all all too long. And so first I want to confront some hard truths. Okay, we've talked about um on Monday the um kind of increasing our capacity for hard truths. So let me let me speak some things that I believe may be hard truths to deal with. One we may value, as a, as, a, as a dominantly white church, Greenwich, okay, I'm just talking to Greenwich now, we may value some things higher than our faith, our relationship with other Christians, um, our unity in Christ. We may actually value some things higher than our faith, but not be aware of it. We may value our comfort, our convenience, um, our preferences, so if I were to start introducing ethnic music, I would expect some pushback at Greenwich. I get pushback when we just sing a hymn that nobody knows so well, right? We've done that recently, right? I hear about it. Why can't we sing songs that we are familiar with? Great question. But see, that's the point. If on a Sunday morning, the pastor selects a hymn that is less well known than other hymns that we know, and the pastor hears about it. The tendency for the pastor is not to select those hymns. Now imagine introducing ethnic music into Greenwich so that we could attract others. Ah, that's probably not going to work so well, okay? So it may be that we value things, we value our own comfort, our convenience, our stylistic preferences more than we value kind of a, a racially diverse church, okay? So I'm not trying to call anybody out, but I think there's there's some truth here, okay? Secondly, it, it, it's, it's a, a likely hard truth that we are blind to the ways we have accommodated ourselves to enculturated expressions of the faith, okay? That's a, that's a mouthful. We're blind. We've got blinders on to the ways that we have accommodated ourselves to certain enculturated expressions of the faith. 
again, I'm not calling anybody out. It's just an acknowledgement, okay? The CT article that talks about conflict in the church, these multiracial churches. So let's imagine Greenwich is successful and we get folks from, um, you know, maybe a Korean background and Hispanic background um, and African-American background and predominantly white background. And all of a sudden, which music are we going to sing? Which Sunday are we going to try to sing all kinds of music on every Sunday. Now the service is stretched beyond an hour. Okay. So that's the point. Okay. So each church, whether ethnic church, white, Korean, um, Hispanic, etc., or multiracial, there's this tension. We come to expect the faith to be expressed in forms of that are familiar to us. And so we're probably blind at Greenwich to the ways in which we've done that, okay? But we're also blind to the ways that sin and the fall have worked themselves into our lives and in our faith. So if we trace the sin all the way back to the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that's where we set ourselves up to be the judges of good and evil, but not just we, I, I do it, you do it. Every person does it. That's the curse. Every human being made in the image of God, blessedly, is broken to the point that they actually believe they're right. So then we, as individuals who are judging good and evil, right and wrong, we gather into little tribes, what I call moral tribes. This is one of these common themes. And the moral tribe is defined by those who agree with me. And one of the default tribal mechanisms is to default to the tribe of skin color, okay? Those who look like me and sound like me, that's my tribe. And then we tend to look down or demonize or or somehow not uh, be kind to those outside the tribe. And so... <clears throat> It, 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 it's probably happening in ways that we're not even aware of, right? That sin just kind of embeds. Now, uh, to like hymns over contemporary music itself is not a sin. To look down on people who sing a different kind of music is the sin. To like hymns is not the sin. To like contemporary music and to prefer that over hymns is not the sin. To look at others as somehow less than you, to look at them as an inferior with some contempt or some judgment, that's the sin. So, so um, to, to look down on others is where the sin sets in. And, and so those who don't worship the way we worship, those who don't look the way we look, those who don't act the way we act, when we start to look down on people, there's the sin. And so we've, we're probably blind to the ways that that has worked itself into our church life, okay? Um, but we're also blind, I think, to the ways that we fail to live up to the truths that we claim. Genesis chapters one and two, all people created in the image of God, okay? So hu all humans, whatever skin color, whatever language, whatever custom are made in the image of God. Um, this, this New Testament reality that in Christ, there is no Jew, no Greek, okay? So the, 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 ethnic division that was there at first is, is taken away in Christ. Um, it, it's not that there's not ethnic diversity, it's that in Christ we find a unity. The Great Commission, go to all nations, all ethne, go to all peoples, all people groups, all tribes, uh, languages, etc. The picture of heaven in Revelation chapter 5, Jesus has purchased from every tribe and language, nation and people. And so the blood of Christ is shed for all people. And heaven will consist of people from every tribe and language and nation, okay? So, so you've got these, we would fail to live up to this, okay? We, we don't concern ourselves as much with these truths, perhaps, as we ought to. That is seeking a, a racially and, and ethnically diverse church. But one of the hard biblical truths that we rarely wrestle with is this notion of the Jew-Gentile split, 
Okay, so the old covenant reality, God sets his people apart, Abraham's family, they are the Jews, everybody else are the Gentiles. That becomes so deeply embedded in the mindset of uh, the Jewish people and frankly of Gentiles, of non-Jews, such that when Jesus shows up, there's this mentality, even amongst the disciples, that Messiah, Jesus as Messiah, only comes to save the Jews. We see this illustrated in Acts chapter 10, when Peter goes to Cornelius, a Roman centurion, and speaks to them of the gospel, and they receive the gospel and the Holy Spirit, and Peter kind of has a slap his head moment. Now I understand that God shows no favoritism, but that he calls people from all ethne, all nations. Even after the death and resurrection of Jesus, even after Pentecost and the Holy Spirit, Peter is still thinking Jesus is only for the Jews. That's how deeply embedded it is, and we don't even recognize that. Now, we are mostly the Gentile church, right? So we are Gentiles. So the Jew-Gentile controversy in the early church is threaded throughout all the pages of the New Testament epistles. How do we fit Jew and Gentile together, this ethnic diversity? Because the Jews are like, well, they have to obey all the law of Moses and have to be circumcised and you can't eat certain kinds of food. So all these, these mosaic laws... The, the Gentiles have to uphold. So the first general assembly, as it were, the Jerusalem Council in Acts chapter 15 addresses that. So, so there's this reality. It's one thing to reach. So Paul, the apostle, becomes the, the apostle to the Gentiles. He gets kind of turned out by the, from the synagogues. He goes to the Jews first because they know the scriptures. This is Messiah. This Jesus, who I was trying to persecute, is Messiah. He's Lord. He's raised. And the, the, the Jews turn him out, and so Paul goes to the Gentiles. Easier to reach the Gentiles than actually integrate them into local church expressions with Jews, with Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. That's the tension. So what we're dealing with today is nothing new. There's nothing new. And I'm a little disappointed that my Christianity Today article articles don't lift that reality up. This is nothing new. The church from the beginning has wrestled with how to integrate diversity, these racial diversity, the commission to go preach to the nations. Well, it happened. Oops, we don't know how we fit together. And so you have kind of primarily Jewish churches that set up and primarily Gentile churches. So over time, primarily white churches, primarily Korean churches, primarily Hispanic churches, primarily Cameroonian churches or African-American churches. And so we birds of a feather flock together. This is what humans do. It's, it's just a, a, a part of the reality. So a couple passages I want to wrestle with. One, um, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Paul writes this. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ... He is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. And then he goes on from there. So it's this Pauline notion that in Christ, there is no Jew nor Greek. Looking at people from a worldly point of view. So uh, he writes in Galatians, you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. And then the same thing he writes in Colossians uh, chapter 3. Here, that is in Christ, here there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. And so it's this notion that in Christ, 
racial and ethnic and 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 gender uh, sex you know male and female these those these things that formerly uh you know helped us to kind of categorize people oh i know who you are you're one of those people right <laughs> In Christ, those divisions, those humanly erected divisions go away and we become, there's a unity that we find in Christ. But the implication is outside of Christ, we don't find that unity. Outside of Christ, there is Jew or Greek. Outside of of Christ, there is slave and free. And so it's this idea um, when he writes about no longer looking at people from a worldly point of view. The, the term worldly is actually katasarka, according to the flesh. So the human sense, apart from Christ, as fallen creatures, that's the worldly point of view. We look at people according to their skin color. We look at them according to their ethnicity. Uh, we look at them according to their custom. And so in Christ, we don't look at people that way anymore. So I, I'm wondering if the project of racial justice, as we hear it lifted up in our society by the uh, critical race theorists and others, is actually a project that is doomed to fail because it does not seek a unity in Christ. In Christ, there is no Jew nor Greek. Outside of Christ, there is Jew and Greek and Scythian and barbarian, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Outside of Christ, we look at people from a worldly point of view. And so the the critical race theorists that lift up oppression and power as the primary uh, reality, that's the framework with which they work, that they would they would say that people are identified by their skin color. Okay? You're not an individual, you are your group identity, okay? You're your tribe, if I can say it that way, okay? So critical race theory kind of pushes a tribalism, okay? You are the group to which you belong. And it doesn't matter if you are a a white person who's a Christian who is committed deeply to racial unity and and welcomes, you're white, you're an oppressor. You have used power to oppress people. I say, oh, I, 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 I haven't. Oh no, you're so. So critical race theory looks at things from a worldly point of view, like Paul used to do that. I used to look from a worldly point of view, uh, according to the flesh, according to this fallen um, reality, this tribalism. But I, I, I do not do so any longer. In Christ, now we're new creations, and we're all one. And so critical race theory um, really is about um, pushing a tribalism. It's doomed to fail. Only in Christ will we find a unity. So here's some, uh, an irony. If you think about the church, the church of Jesus Christ is the most racially, ethnically diverse institution on the planet, and it's been sustained. It's done it for 2,000 years, right? So for 2,000 years, our very mission is to include people from every tribe and language, nation and tongue. That's the missionary endeavor. That's why uh, Austin and Sinte House are over there in in Myanmar, and they're laboring to see others come into the family. The church is committed to a racial uh, diversity, but a unity in Christ so that we don't look at each other according according to these tribal lenses, like critical race theory encourages us to do, okay? Now, do we default to that ourselves, sometimes even as Christians? Yes, that's the blinded to the ways that we have become enculturated. And so when we have a vision of the universal church, I believe in the Holy Catholic Church, this this church that is spread throughout all, all lands, all places, all time, who, who claims Jesus Christ, there we have an understanding of the, 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 that's the multiracial, multi-ethnic church. But the local church always will struggle. Local churches, the Christianity Today article saying, they're, it, it's not going so well as we might think it would be. There are some churches that are kind of doing okay. But the reality is birds of a feather flock together. And I'm wondering 
if we should be okay with that, okay? Now, in saying that, we should be advocating for sisters and brothers in Christ who find themselves uh, at, at odds. So local churches will always be shaped by enculturated realities, music, food, style, format, leadership. It, it, it's inescapable. It's not just white folks who do this. All people do this. We tend to flock towards people who, who, who experience life the way we experience it. And so there are going to be these enduring kind of Jew-Gentile struggles as the first church dealt with it. So our own day is dealing with it in, in this way. And so what, what Paul writes uh, is that we should welcome one another as Christ welcomed us. This is, this is the goal. So I, I'm, I'm going to try to maybe think a little bit more about this tomorrow or in coming days. But we should advocate for other sisters and brothers in Christ. We should always advocate. We should always have their back. Um, I'm not so confident that the secular project of racial reconciliation and, and racial unity and racial equality. I am not that confident that that project is, will succeed. The degree to which it did succeed in the 50s and 60s and 70s is when it was led by those who were clearly religious, Christian religious leaders and, and, and preaching a message of unity in Jesus Christ and, and lifting the scriptures up like Martin Luther King Jr. and others. But absent that Christian emphasis and, and the critical race theorists are not bringing, <laughs> they're not calling for a unity in Christ. They're calling for an overthrow of the oppressor. They're, they're really calling for a new tribalism. And so I think, there's, I think this project may be doomed to fail. So um, have gone on long enough. Uh, this should give us a little food for thought uh, overnight. And uh, we'll pick up again uh, on the new day with some additional thinking. Um, but this is a question I put to you. How will you engage the work of, of racial justice and unity in society, in your community, in the church as a Christian? How, how can we do that and yet not be uh, inappropriately influenced by these non-Christian views? So that gives us something to think about. Let's close with prayer. Lord, we thank you that in Christ we find a, a hope and a unity and a freedom and a joy and a peace, and we find forgiveness for the ways in which we have not lived out your call to reconciliation and to truth and to grace and to welcome. Forgive us, O oh Lord, where we at Greenwich, where we in our individual or family lives have, have not advocated for our sisters and brothers of color, where we have we have sought to uphold divisions rather than seek a, a unity in Christ. And so, Lord, lead us in this Lenten season in a path of, of humility and repentance. And we, we yearn for a fullness in the unity of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, and who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. May the God who is assembling the nobles of the nations as the people of the God of Abraham, may the God who is calling men and women, boys and girls from every tribe and language, nation and people, may that God bless you and keep you this day and forevermore. Amen.